And now it's time for the WHDT World News featured interview. When MSNBC anchor Melissa Harris Perry brazenly told the American public that children belong to the state, or as she put it, the community, she enraged a substantial segment of the population that retains the capacity for critical thinking. The reason why some people reacted that way is because the government-controlled educational establishment failed to process them correctly. This is why they can examine claims logically and weren't cowed into silence in the interest of conformity. Unfortunately, those Americans who display such traits are an embattled and dwindling minority. It's been said that the genuine purpose of government education is to teach children how to stand in line, that is, to be deferential to authority, to think of themselves as part of the collective, and to indoctrinate them regarding the supposed virtues of conformity. But this process isn't limited to the schoolroom. As historian and cultural observer Richard Grove points out, it is an all-encompassing and never-ending campaign of psychological warfare intended to destroy the ability of Americans to think of themselves as autonomous and morally intelligent individuals. Richard is the founder of Tragedy and Hope Communications, which creates educational media intended to provide individuals with the educational resources necessary to attain PhD-level mastery of history and philosophy. Richard, it's a genuine privilege to have you back on the program. Uh, America was created as a nation that cherished and protected individual liberty, yet today it is arguably one of the most collectivist societies on the planet. Uh, as a historian and student of culture and social control, what do you feel is at the root of America's decline? Well, Gary, it's a pleasure to be back. As you mentioned, uh, the cultural phenomenon known as co uh, co uh, compulsory schooling the forced schooling, and schooling as a term, is the removing of individuality. So what we have as an education system is not really about education, rather it's about removing the individuality and curiosity from students, ruining the integrity of their minds. And psychological warfare is simply a population that is willing to believe things that are not true, and they won't question declarative sentences to actually get to the bottom of what knowledge is in that instance. They'd rather believe it, and uh, that's one of the main problems in this country. Richard, all this has happened without our country being conquered by a foreign rival. How have the values of Americans been surreptitiously changed over the past century, and in what way? Well, I think it's been incremental, and though we haven't been physically conquered by any rival, we've been psychologically and mentally and intellectually conquered in our minds by reverting back to a stimulus response mentality. And, and instead of putting you know, thinking back in between our stimulus and response, that is our choice to think or not to think in any given situation. When you, outs uh, when you outsource that thinking to someone else, when you believe what they're saying, when they're using a declarative sentence, which is an argument, it is a conclusion, it should be justified by a proof of existence in order to be knowledge. So without that process, that fundamental process, people are left to love their servitude, to be peasants and serfs to a system they don't understand, and they feel trapped as, as slaves should because they're not asking the questions and the questions bring about a prisoner mentality where you can actually escape that voluntary servitude that we're all bound to through the school system that indoctrinates it and the corporate media that traditionally backs it up. Richard, you use an expression that will be unfamiliar to many of our audience, uh, the decontextualization of history. What is this and what are some of, of the current examples of it? Well, traditionally, history is written by the victors. So history itself is a more of an index to things that might have happened a certain way. But you really need to go out and search out the alternative perspectives so that you can have true comparison and contrast so that you can find the essence of the situation. And only then can you define what's actually going on, who's participating, and talk about anything with substance and knowledge to it. So the decontextualization of history is removing that useful knowledge and information and alternative perspectives that are available to present you with themes of Lincoln or Spartacus or any of the new shows that are out that use historical characters but don't give you any historical background that is actually and factually true. Rather, they would just, you know, history is not interesting enough for them. They would rather just make things up for the purpose of entertainment and fleecing a public that doesn't resist. And they're not resisting because they're not thinking about it. But if you were actually to think about what you're seeing on TV and the resistance would build up, they would be forced to show us something different at least that's entertaining because entertaining means it has substance 
and changes you in a, in a positive way for your life afterwards. Otherwise, it's a waste of your time and it's not entertainment. That would be psychological warfare, and that's what you traditionally see on TV. Richard, through your podcast, The Peace Revolution, you offer a curriculum designed to help individuals be autonomous thinkers by learning that which no college or university can afford to provide. Uh, could you briefly describe it for our audience? Well, what I'm talking about there is a, a process of self-learning that I had to discover for myself. You know, being a corporate worker, uh, working at an you know, enterprise level in the technology industry, working for uh, center, the, some of these uh, clients that were the largest financial services companies in the world, I found out during that process, uh, after becoming a whistleblower and what led me to media production, that I needed to do a lot of learning for myself and that on that path of learning, when I find things that are credible and you know, unbelievable yet factual, I should create the media that you know, shares that. So informally, it, it didn't start out as a curriculum, but over the years, it's the useful information that people are being denied through the traditional media and curriculums of universities, specifically what the theme is through the Peace Revolution podcast, is the fact that you can learn anything for yourself without a teacher by using a method that delivers high degrees of consistency and certainty, and that makes what they teach as far as a compartmentalized PhD, Prussian PhD system, obsolete. And so when the world is being run by people who have come out of Prussia, and this Prussian education system is what infected American education starting in the mid-1800s, su uh, successful up till now, and it's only through people like Charlotte Iserby, through her deliberate dumbing down of American education, and John Taylor Gatto in his underground history of Amer American education, that you can see that America has been incrementally socialized to bring about a, a globalist state and that's not a conspiracy theory, that's a statement of fact that can be backed up by several hundred textbooks, memoirs, and uh, recitations, and citations, and articles of the people who are prolifically and profoundly involved in such agendas. They don't hold a, an American agenda, they don't want self-reliance, they don't want critical thinkers in this country. They have sought to destroy the values of this country by redefining the terms, by taking away the word liberty from our culture, and we've been taught to think that it's slavery. So when you think that liberty and slavery are equivalent and you've lost the meaning to those words, there has been a break with reality. And it is that mental illness that is reflected throughout our culture as long as we embrace irrationality instead of using that which exists as our metric for truth. Richard, you've seen and heard the statement by Melissa Harris Perry. Uh, we've recently uncovered some commonality with Adolf Hitler uh, in the same quote, but here is uh, the MSNBC host again. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. Now, Richard, this is the quote that we uncovered uh, from Adolf Hitler from a speech that he gave in 1933. He stated, when an opponent declares, I will not come over to your side, I calmly say, your child belongs to us already. What are you? You will pass on your descendants. However, now stand in the new camp. In a short time, they will know nothing else but this new community. As someone who's adept at translating collectivism into understandable English, could you tell us what she is saying here and the common ground that is shared with Adolf Hitler and why this should concern us? Well, that's a famous uh, quote by Hitler, but it's not the only quote that speaks about, you know, give us the control of your child by age five and we'll have him forever. Lenin said similar things. The Jesuits have said similar things. So it's all about indoctrinating our youth into a new way of life where the, the morals and values are irrational. They have no connection to existence and an individual becomes part of a collective through citizenship to a state. And once that citizenship to a state becomes tyrannical, if, you're, if your government's not serving you, if they're not acting like servants and they're acting like authorities, how did they get those special rights? What is the train of logic from me and you that they got rights that we don't have? And so when you encounter that irrationality, you have to stop and think because history does repeat itself and without focusing on the words that are actually being said for instance in that MSNBC propagandized promo there's four declarative sentences in there if you analyze the terms the terms are ambiguous the premises are untrue there's many contradictions within those four sentences and therefore it's an intellectually bankrupt position I don't want to speak on the messenger I want to speak on the message because when you do not dismiss that as arbitrary and carry on thinking that Oh, it's a good idea. Our kids belong to us, but they're also part of the collective. If you don't stop and analyze and question those declarative sentences, 
You are being taken advantage of, you are being duped, and that's what psychological warfare is meant to do. What you can do is recognize it, question it, and release yourself from its belief. Richard, this may seem like an odd question for some of our audience, but could you focus on, on what statists mean when they refer to community? Uh, that, that is a term, it's very commonplace, but is it correct to say that it takes on a sinister connotation when it's employed by the likes of Melissa Harris Perry? Well, again, I don't want to comment on the messenger, but let's think about it. Anything, when it removes your volition and your personal agreement from it, becomes tyrannical. So anytime you have a community that's based on collectivism, and collectivism is simply denying your right to life, the right to think your own thoughts, to property, and all that, that comes with it as a derivative. The, uh, the derivatives of that are known as the Bill of Rights. These, uh, in, these rights are endowed by logic and reason, and that's why they wrote them down. They should have written down maybe a preamble of, you know, existence exists, the king of Britain exists, uh, they're being tyrannical and, and gone down from existence. But when you break that off and you have that philosophy midstream, then it's open to attack, which you've seen the Bill of Rights be dissolved because people don't have that connection to these rights are there because you exist and because you have rights inherently as a human being to resist tyranny for your own survival. And so forgetting that brings us under control. Richard, we mentioned the, the commonality between uh, Melissa Harris Perry and Adolf Hitler, uh, and now there's, there's a homeschooling family from Germany uh, where homeschooling is illegal, and this family has sought uh, and been denied refugee status by the Obama administration. Attorney General Eric Holder has said that homeschooling is not a constitutionally protected right. What are the implications of this case for those who seek to free themselves and their children from the government-dominated educational system? Well, with Attorney General Holder, uh, I don't want to address the messenger, but you have to question the nature of that messenger and his integrity and Fast and Furious and what he's there to do. If he's the highest appointed lawmaker in the land, then what law is being broken by homeschoolers that he should have any opinion on what their rights are? Their rights are not part of his law. Their rights exist because they're human beings. And if you're a human being, you own yourself, you own your children, you have the right to help your children be educated about this world. And that includes the tyrannical you know, corruption that goes on and the corruption that's not resisted because people believe that authority has the right to plunder your production.